I'm sitting in a pub in a very posh little road in Chelsea that has a barrier at the end of it. Whether it's to keep Riff Raff out or Harry Finlay in, I'm not entirely sure, but I'm joined by Harry Finlay, Lazarus Finlay as I call him, because you can't knock him down with a mallet, he's bounced back from more reverses, shall we say, Harry, than you can possibly imagine. And you have been one of those illuminating gambling figures who we occasionally worry about your sanity and your solvency, but somehow you struggle on. How do you do it? I don't know. Jonathan, I know Jonathan Spark was the first person to call me Lazarus, and uh, that was down at the St Catherine's Dock, where this old city index office was. And funny enough, there was a model of Lazarus in this big thing, and I couldn't believe it. And he explained who Lazarus was. So. Uh, he was the Not first. being a big Bible scholar no, yourself. No, exactly. No. And uh, he was the first to tell me, uh, to, call, to you know, mention Lazarus, and you're, and you're certainly not the second person to do it. So uh, we're on a punt in front. Uh, Where did it start? Where was the seed sown? Um, How enough, old? It, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was playing the small games at school, penny dice, and not penny dice, penny playing against the first game was playing fives against the wall with a tennis ball in a real tough school, all, all better footballers than me, but real tough school. And then it was pitch and toss. Then the then the poker dice was the next level up. Crown and anchor, did that come into it? No, no. no it was already was, illegal by then. Yeah, yeah. no, it was um, it was that basically going ground racing for the first the first time. Was, and where was that? That was at Slough. That was at Slough after my first, that afternoon I was at Newbury. Come Ra friendly bombs and rain on Slough. Great John Betjeman first line to a poem. You'd have read that as well. No, I haven't read that, but I went to Slough Dogs a few times after going that first time. And um, I was mesmerised at, at the trial. I was in, at the, the same day, funny enough, um, I was at Newbury from the first, the first ever National Hunt meeting, the first ever race meeting. And I, the thing I remember most about that, apart from being blown away by the horses jumping the fences was the tickets, the old fashioned yeah, tickets yeah, in the seventies yeah. with the numbers, with the, and colours the pictures. And, yeah, and yeah. I, I mean, I just remember going back with handfuls of tickets and just, it, that blew me head off. And then going to the dogs that night, you know, but the racing, the racing never changes. And I, I think that, um, I think that as a betting medium, I'm amazed even now. I mean, I've, I've been on the fight back for the last two or three years. And although it's been tough, it's, it, it still reminds you more than ever that there's nothing compares with the buzzer back in the winner especially when it matters and I think that I think that the way the way racing is now and, and, and in, in the betting I, I think it, it can go forward I think that it's, it's a great betting medium and it's only it's only really been this season after everything that happened to me that I've really realized how much fun it is you know betting to more I mean in the olden days I I can't explain how, how brave I was as a punter and uh, compared with now brave I'm, or stupid no no it has to be brave because I, I'm an overall you know real big winner so you it has to be Everything, everything's relative, I think, in all days. But I remember people talk about owning Denman and winning the Gold Cup and how did I feel, and it, it was fantastic. And you were there straight after it happened, and I think with you, I got a little bit overexcited, the heat at the moment, or whatever. But you know, I remember it was only a, it was only a few years, a handful of years before, where I was down, I was in, I was in the stand in the best position on the race course, an hour and twenty minutes before the champion hurdle, watched flagship Uber Alice when I think the race before, but I had. In the whole world, in 1999, I had 180 grand in the whole world. And I promise you, I was stood there, me, we had dinner the night before in the Drainsfield house, me, Kay, Rasha and Frank, helicoptered in, and I had 165,000 of that 180 on Easterbrack, uh, an average of eight to 11. And I'd had the money on two or three weeks before, because I made, I made him a free on chance. And he went off 49 and he, he pissed up. But jumping, jumping, jumping the last, he come there, crew, jumping the last, my, my legs wobbled. I remember I was That's in the right, a wobble, proper, your legs proper, too. no proper, proper buckle. Even though I mean, what I'd, what I'd have done if he'd have been under pressure or looked like getting beat, Lord only knows. But I really buckled. Now, whenever Denman's won anything, I've never actually buckled. But as a gambler, if you, I, I can't tell you over the years how much trust I'd put in National One horses. Mm. And when they get beat, mm. it's the end of the. It feels like the end of the world. I thought Sam Crow. I put my hands up. So does Gordon Elliott. By the way, he thought the same thing. I thought Sam Crow was the second coming, and this year, both times, both times, the first two times he got beat after Bouvardier, that was enough for me because I don't think much of Bouvardier. So, but the first two times when he got beat this year, I, I felt much worse than I did as an owner when we also got beat as an owner. I actually went out the betting shop and you know, sort of buckled a bit because, 
Only horse, only, I, I think only national hunt horses can do that. And I remember when Easter Brett run, I was coursing, when Easter Brett run in one of the prep races, I used to love Easter Brett, and, and I was, I think it was at, uh, I think it was, would have been JP's open with me, Limerick or one of those. Or Lim Clonmel. Or no, it wasn't Clonmel, because no. we were coursing near yeah, there. Yeah. And it was a fair, it was up, I'm pretty sure it was Limerick, but Easter Brett was seven on. There was a great forecast that day, a two and a half mile horse to come second. It was always going to run on and not lead. It was a blinder. So I lumped on the forecast, but I thought there was such a good view there that I thought what I'll do is I'll watch, I'll, I'll watch them land off the second last and I'll run between the second last and the last hurdle. You ran? Jogged, yeah, but yeah, this jogged. Is, that, that's not the point. The point is that I wasn't alone. In Ireland, I wasn't alone. There was about, there was a, no word of a lie, about 20, tw between 20 and 25 middle-aged women running between the set who'd worked out the same thing to run and You're watch Disney Brat. No, what I'm saying is people, what other country in the world would you get middle-aged women running between the second last and the last hurdle to get a look of a horse? The two shrewdest things I learned from Paul Barber. Every year at Nichols before the jump season starts, they have this six furlong gallop on the yeah, flat yeah, and yeah. every year there's a rocket on oh, Nichols. Oh, it's a yeah. dream, the tire furlong. First time out, lump on job, beat. Keen, fast, beat, fast. Or, anyway, Whenever, whenever there was a nap down at Ditchy, I'd always ring up the old man Barber and say, Paul, what do you think of this? And the shrewdest thing, yeah, he said it, I think it was the second year I was there, I wish I'd, you know, I wish I'd have realised then just how right he was, but I soon worked it out. And there was one also rung him up about a bit of a boat and uh, I said, so-and-so, this nap today. And I said, what do you think? And he said, slow horse will win. But there was another shape ball that caused you some grief, that rugby shape thing. Yeah, uh, well, it, it, you, it, it you cost me... You really did go yes, you know, out well, into the wilderness over the All Blacks and the World Cup. Yeah, well, I've done, you know, that's, what, that's one of those things where I, when, when that did go wrong. But... Uh, how wrong did it go and how did it come about? Well, it just came about because I fell in love with Dan Carter because he's, yeah. the, he's of all the Federers and the... And I do fall in love with the sports stars early which is a good habit, <laughs> especially Tiger Woods. Um, but uh, uh, but um, no, Dan Carter was something special about him. And uh, the, the whole team, the whole setup, the coach, everything about him, I just thought they were un unplayable. Different culture. Well, it, 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 to, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think they're good things this year. Although, no, but uh, then. Uh, but then, and, and to be honest, it all went wrong. We all know now, it all went wrong. And I knew at the time when I should have come to bet, but did a bit later. But when Argentina beat France in the first game because that meant that New Zealand had three games to win and not two. And they were playing in Wales with that bad pitch. And it was, it was a quarter-final, was it not? Quarter France, final, yeah. All Blacks. Yeah. The greatest ref now, now the greatest referee in the world, Wayne Barnes, gave two forward tries that even from behind the goal I could see there were forward tries. But uh, no, that so what were you looking at? You were sitting down, you've had a nice bottle of champagne. No, it was a, it, I, no I bet him over two years, which made it even right. worse because over that two-year period, I told all the so many other people to back him, and that that's what made it so bad. But looking back on it, um, no, uh, you know. What was the damage? Uh, 1.9, 1.9. And was it the first time it really got through to you that your betting could damage other people? Is it great? No, story. no, no. Was just, it great story about your? Was it your? Chap who did the garden or whatever. Oh, the gardener, yeah, you like that story, did you? Everyone well, likes it. but I mean, <laughs> but, uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of a pungent tale. Yeah, it is a pungent tale. He's doing but the it's... garden, he comes in with a wedge of money. Oh, listen, listen when Denver was... Done his... When Denver was... When Denver was... Exactly, but you, when you're a gambler, when you people know you're a gambler, like in Australia, I'm sort of... There's more gamblers in Australia. I'm, you know, people say to me, Harry, give us a tip, or, ever, or taxi drivers in London, when they reckon I say, Harry, give us a tip, and... I thought they blocked their ears. But I take it so serious. I take it so seriously. There's, I know you, do. you know, and, and and so that I mean that I just remember being on the train thinking, you know, and uh, it was even worse than I thought because the people, the, some mates of mine, are taking liberties, and you know, had more on than they than, than they should have done. Punting now. What's the shape of it? Oh, I love, I'm just amazed how much I love betting novice chasers. It hurts when they get beat when you get it wrong. But you have a novice chase addiction, don't you? A little bit. I just think that when if you could inhale novice chases, you would. Yeah, I, I, I would, and I, I still, you know, and to it, look, looking back at Denman, when he, the, the Sun Alliance is a, is a, is a particular race favourite of mine, and uh, the day after Easter Brett won, when we had the lump on, we had a lump on Nick Dundee, and back to Annie Post, and when he fell for it out, I think I fell off the bed. We watched it the next day, we were in the hotel. Frank did fall off the bed, and because uh, he was going to absolutely shit in, and looks like trouble ended up winning the Gold Cup, but... In the book, I mentioned Kildimo when mm. Kildimo was 13 to 2, Alistair, to win yeah. the Royal Sun Alliance. Yeah. Like, I genuinely made him 9 to 4, yeah. and I've genuinely got two pence in the world. And the only chance that I'm getting any money is off Barry Flick. And I've gone up to his shop, 
it's a cracking story and I won't go into it now but anyway three hours later I managed to talk him into lending me another 200 quid and Stanley was right down the corner and bang Kildimo Sun Alliance I remember Royal Athlete wasn't a certainty but mm -hmm. being pain when he got beat but it's always been a race that's very close to my heart and when Denman and Aces fall running that the Sun Alliance when we won that day when you come down to me house and it was pouring with rain and we thought Denman was going to be four to nine in a four runner race and suddenly him and Aces four a flying machine of 30 Murphys 30 Murphys are going flat out and, um, and the ground had dried the ground had dried it was like it was like, I don't think I don't, I don't think two chasers have ever gone faster over three miles and and to see Denman you know pull Aces four jump the third last they all said he mis made a mistake but he never he just buckled because of the pressure of taking on Denman for a two miles round Cheltenham and um, Denman that day was, you know, the, my favourite race, to go, to go and win, win, win my favourite race was, uh, was, was amazing. As I said, I only wanted to own dogs and not horses. And I always thought, why do kings and these, you know, they always say it's a sport of kings. And mm -hmm. I always thought, why do really, really wealthy people want to own horses? It can't be that much of a buzz owning a horse. And I remember walking in the parade ring at Cheltenham for that race when he got beat by Nick and all. And there'd just been an atmosphere like, mm -hmm. like, like at the Ryder Cup at the Belfry mm -hmm. when it, suddenly mm -hmm. the Yanks spewed it up. And all the hairs on the back of your end, but and that was the one time as an owner where I thought, Jesus, now I, I remember thinking, I now I it. know, now I get I it why, it. Yeah. now I get it why shakes and mm. kings mm. want to own mm. these great horses. Mm. And How, I'm much older than you. I haven't missed a day at Cheltenham Festival since I was 19. That's 44 years or something absurd. What I love is the gathering of the people. They just it's not just a matter of passion. It's a question of knowing what they're watching. Oh, I've said it many times, Alistair. I mean, uh, growing up, I mean, I, I, I watched. I don't think there's a bigger Cheltenham enthusiast than yourself. And to see you, to I, I remember to cut some of the comments. I used to get my missus to make me. A, <laughs> we talked about it last night. I used to get to make me Cheltenham breakfast because Cheltenham was so special. <laughs> and she stood for that for about three years. And uh, then your face would pop up, and you and you'd be so excited. And you know, it, it, it is it is unique, but. What you say is right about the knowledge, and I've always said it's the most knowledgeable crowd in the world. Mm. If you have the World Cup final, European Cup final, as Roy Keane says, you've got your prawn sandwiches brigade. Yeah. But national, the Cheltenham Festival is just unique. The knowledge of the knowledge of the punters, and in the olden days when there was no, not even any TV replays or obviously yeah. no screens, if the second favourite made a mistake in the arcle, yeah. you could hear the crowd, the whole crowd of you mm. know be ooh and ah, and, and you know the the, the 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 crowd would almost give you the, give you the commentary and. It, 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 to be fair, that's, the atmosphere is still absolutely fantastic now, but pre-big screens and pre-telly days, it was almost uniquely brilliant. Just it was out. uncanny how oh. they could read it on the far side. And yeah. in gambling in general, we have we have generally in the middle of people talk about gambling, they either talk about the, the, the real big syndicates and the big winners or invariably the losers, but in national hunt racing, there's a whole plethora of people out there who make a living out of punting, they're dentists, and there's the yeah. national hunt people are so... We, not just at Cheltenham festivals, week in, week out, mm. they're, they're getting the racing post, they're having 100 quid, 200 quid bets on National Hunt horses, and over the year, they're winning enough to go on a holiday, or mm. maybe if it's a bad year, they might do a monkey and not be able to go on such a good holiday. But, I mean, we were talking earlier about Ruby Walsh and schooling horses at Nichols, and when the big festival was on, and I, at one stage I had three or four Chip Festival mm. runners at a meeting, mm. so mm. I was involved right at the, at the cliff face. And I remember one year, we went up to Stratford with Glenn and Barry and the boys, and we went into a pub we fought before Cheltenham. We, I think it was a day Nick and all, maybe, or even, yeah, even yeah. it was a year after that, I think, because we were at even more horses. But we went into a pub in Stratford, and we'd been at all the work and seen everything and been involved in the preparation. We walked in the pub, sat down with these guys, four or five punters, and they knew more than us. Yeah. They knew more about yeah. They knew more about all the yeah. runs and Denman's point to point and yeah. so and so. I mean, what the, you know, and where else could that happen? Where else could you be that involved? And yet ordinary people know as much as you, if not more. Only National Hunt Racing. And I live in Devon now, and I haven't been recently, but I've popped in now and again. Because when you go and see, when you go and see those shrewdies with the binoculars having them one and two hundred pound bets, don't think they're guessing at National Hunt Racing. They know everything. The trouble with you is you've lost your passion for it. No, you? I'll never lose my passion for gambling. And as you say, every, honestly, every as long as you're gambling, you've always got a chance and you've always got something to look forward to. And if you only have one bet all day, your mood on that day will be decided on how that bet performs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the one thing about the horses. And 
you know, the buzz of it. How can you explain to someone the difference? If you've got 300 quid in the world and you go out on a Wednesday afternoon when everyone else is working and you have 150 pounds on a novice chaser and it, win and it pisses up, how different do you feel with a good earth Chinese, whether it, fall, whether it wins or gets beat? I mean, how can you tell non-gamblers about that kind of buzz? Charlton coming up, what's your advice to that punter in the street? Oh, um, I just think every year with Charlton, the real value now is... There's so many races anti-post that if you really know a horse is going to go for a certain race, go for, you know, then you can really get, if you know, for example, the Sun of Lions again, if you know a horse stays three and a half miles, yeah. it's an hour now, you know it's going to go for it. You back them each way anti-post, it's almost bomb-proof if, if you know the targets. But the other, the downside of that is is knowing what the, what the targets are. And mm -hmm. I think Cheltenham, I mean, I think Cheltenham looks really hard this year and some of the powers who know more than me. I think that's a great description of you, Harry. Almost bomb-proof. Cheers. Thank you.